there are all kinds of people out there who are every week, believe it or not, are trying to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Uh, there are celebrities, even this day, this morning, that are trying to worship the Lord in spirit and truth. Uh, you may have heard of Mark Wahlberg. I was reading about him, how he tries to worship twice on Sunday. Uh, Reese Witherspoon uh, worships in Santa Monica. Uh, you've heard of Tim Tebow attends church uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night. Uh, Tim McGraw, Faith Hill, they attend church. Kate Middleton go to a church and uh, with uh, Prince Williams, and that's regular. Matthew McConaughey, well known. Since he's had kids, he attends church regularly on Sunday morning. Jennifer Garner in her hometown in West Virginia. Uh, the pastor's son, Joe jo Jones, regularly attends church. Selena Gomez goes to church in Los Angeles. Uh, Nick Jonas, a regular attender uh, most of his life. Josh Duhamel, uh, he is uh, the guy from that, uh, I don't know what do you call him, those Transformer movies. A really nice guy, attends church with his wife, Fergie. Mel Gibson goes to a church called the Church of the Holy Family. Ben Affleck attends church on Sunday with his family. Uh, Katy Perry, was raised by pastor parents and naturally she attends regularly. Oprah Winfrey even attended church in Chicago on a regular basis. So there are, you may hear these names and you may think that, uh, you, know, you know, all those people that are famous, God doesn't mean anything to them. My point is simply that there's a lot more people that are concerned about the next world than you might have realized. And they think about it often. Uh, Robert Kennedy was visiting the Amazon and he came upon a Brazilian Indian and he did not know him obviously and so he decided he'd ask him a couple of questions about what his life was like and so he asked him this simple question and of course he had an interpreter, he didn't speak the language. He says, uh, what do you most like to do and, uh, in, in your daily activities? And he expected the answer to come back something like hunting with a bow and arrows or canoeing or something like that. He lived on the Amazon, so he thought he'd hear something like that. What Robert Kennedy didn't know is that this Indian had just given his life to Christ. And so the answer came back, and this is the answer, what he most liked to do was being occupied with God. And so Robert Kennedy thought he had misunderstood. He says, well, ask him again. Something must have been lost in the translation. So he asked him again what he most liked to do, and his answer came back, being occupied with God. That's a pretty good definition of true worship. Uh, excellent definition, I'd say. There are many great expressions in the scriptures of true worship, if you will, or great worship may be a better way of saying it. For example, you remember Paul and Silas after they were beaten that night. They were spending their night in prayer and songs and they were being lifted up before the earthquake came. I think that's a great example of worship. And then there's Mary's alabaster box that she broke and poured out on Jesus that prepared his body for the burial. What a great expression of love and adoration and worship. And then there's the widow's might where she cast in all that she had, even all of her living, into the treasury as an expression of worship. There's Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his only son that God had given him, and the, even the angel had to stay his hand to stop him from doing it. But he was willing in his heart, and in, in that sense he'd already done it. He'd sacrificed his son. And then there's obviously Jesus himself, who's willing the very night to give his life ransom for the entire world, even though it was a very sorrowful night. Those are great examples, and, and I'm sure that there are many, many more than scriptures. I just wanted to mention those as a few. So what do we mean by, by true worship? Right before your eyes, if you're looking up, you see the, the five basic authorized things in worship. And these are the things that the scriptures spell out that we are to engage in when we worship God. And so we have done all of these already. 
We have done each and every one. We have been involved in praying because the Lord Jesus himself said, I want my house to be a house of prayer. And so we pray and we pray and we pray and then someone else will throw in another prayer. We'll probably have at least another prayer, if not two or three, before this service is over. We pray. We sing. Uh, because in the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to thee. That's the words of the Lord himself, that he would even be in our midst when we're singing praises to God. And so singing and praising God is an appropriate aspect of our worship. Giving, we gave on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside. Even that very scripture was read a while ago because we believe in giving every first day of the week just as the scriptures suggest. And then communing. We take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week uh, as it suggested, the cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ and the bread which we break? Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So every Sunday we are communing with the bread and the body of Christ in the Lord's Supper. And that's the bread and the body this way as well. Uh, I know you understand that. And then exhorting, we get involved in words, Different ones have been up here speaking already. Those words are designed to exhort us all to do what's right, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. So the reason we study the word of God is to exhort each other to continue to believe. Those are the acts of worship that are true worship. And every Sunday we engage in those things. But I want to suggest to you that not everybody is engaged in true worship. And Jesus is obviously offended by what we would call untrue worship. There is such a thing as the offense of self-righteous sacrifice that he talks about in Matthew chapter 12 when he said, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. That's winnowing uh, on the Sabbath day. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? How he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priest? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? And they do that by offering sacrifices, which involves work, and they also uh, circumcise young boys on the eighth day on the Sabbath day and that involves work and so that in the sense would be violating the Sabbath and yet that was their duty. Verse 6 says, Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what it means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So basically he, his problem was whenever we're so self-righteous that we think that we can come and we just make some kind of a sacrifice and say a prayer and then we go on living like the devil. And that is not, that's not true worship. So if we're here just to put a, a bandage on a lifestyle that we're not really trying to live, that's not real worship. We need to truly be sincere when we come here. And the offense also of the self-justifying praise that's talked about in Matthew 15, now he, he's discussing uh, not taking care of your parents, really, uh, and doing it because maybe you don't have a feeling for them or you want to keep the money. But it says, but you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me as a gift to God, then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. That's the honor your father and mother. Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you saying these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips but their heart is far from me and in vain that is worthlessly that in vain they worship me teaching as doctrines the commandments of men in other words anything to do keep my money and not do anything for my parents you know as long as I can keep my money and not do anything for anybody else then and somehow I can still go and I can worship God but if I don't take care of the people in my life, my worship is useless, no matter what I do. Uh, people count more, amen? amen. And you've got to love people. And if you don't love people and take care of the people in your life, all this other that we do is worthless. Worthless because it, it's not sincere. So the Lord, th that kind of worthless 
worship, that untrue worship, really upset him. So I want us to deal with just three realities, okay? Three qualities from this little text that he gave us a while ago. And let's see if we can gain some insight into the one true worship that the Lord expects from us. In this one true worship, it's much more than a place that the Lord is driving home. He says, if you're with me, and I hope you are, in John chapter 4, if you're not, maybe you can turn there. John chapter 4, it was read well, well a minute ago, but let's look at it again. John 4, beginning in verse 19. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place. You see, they're all caught up in the place where one ought to worship. And he says in verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. It's not going to be about the place. You're not going to worship either on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You'll not worship the Father. See, it's, it's not about the place. I know we get caught up in places. You've got to have the right name on the outside of the building. You know, you get caught up in the place. And, and I'm not saying the place it has no significance, but you've got to understand what the Scriptures drive home here. Can I, can I just be very blunt about what the Scriptures driving home here? And that is it's more about being corporate. Uh, the place is not that significant, but there has to be a place to be corporate, does it not? You can't be corporate if everybody's every place. So we have to be together. That's the reason 1 Corinthians 14, 23 says it this way. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place. But the place is not significant except that we just got to get together. There's got to be a corporate worship. The Lord wants us to be together on Sunday. I know that you can meet with God anytime, anywhere you are. You can be out fishing in a boat and meet with God. I understand that. We all accept that. But God wants us to come together in a corporate experience, okay? That's not, that might not be your desire. You may rather be by yourself. But the Lord wants this corporate experience. And so it's more about the corporate rather than it is about the place itself. We, we intend, we've been worshiping here for years, but we intend in a few, maybe in a couple of years, to not be worshiping in this place. We'll be in another place on Lithia Pinecrest. It's not about the place, but it is about the corporate. And it's more about being convinced. It goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 24, but if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all. We need to be convinced. Worship needs to be a time of being convinced of what we say we believe. We sing the songs. You notice they're repetitious. We sing these songs. It is an act of trying to convince ourselves of what we already believe. And we do it over and over again, do we not? Because life hits us in the gut. And it's tough to just walk straight sometimes. Life's just that tough. But we need to convince ourselves once again. So we come here to be convinced. And it's more about being convicted I need to be convicted of things I've done wrong. He goes on to say in verse 24, and he is convicted by all. Quite honestly, I didn't do well this last week. Did you? I messed up a few times. Did you mess up? I said some things I shouldn't have said, thought some things I should had moments of doubt, insecurity, trouble, and I need to be convicted about that. Uh, so I've come here, not because of this place, but because I need that experience of being convicted. And then it's also more about being contrite. He goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 14, 25, and thus the secrets of his heart are revealed. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. If God's going to be among us, I must be contrite about what I've done wrong. I need to be humble before the Lord. That's when worship is taking place. What is the one true worship? It's when it's corporate, when we're really convinced, when I'm really convicted, and when I am contrite before the Lord. That's when it's happening. It isn't about the place, although we've got to meet somewhere. It's not about that, though. Number two, the one true worship is more than a performance. 
We don't come here to somehow get God's attention with a big show. You know, if we have a big enough show, and, and I know we don't have as big a show as some churches. Some churches have bands and all kinds of things and rattle traps and everything else. But, but bottom line is it's not about the performance. It's not about whether or not you sang on key, although we like it when you do. John 4 verse 22 says, You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. And so the, the Jews had been the ones with their priests and, and their service and everybody goes and they could watch worship. You notice that? They went and they watched worship. They killed an animal. They watched that happen. Watched it being gutted. Watched it being thrown up on a fire. They watched the fire go up. They watched it and observed it happening. Now the synagogues were different because they were actually engaged in it and, and that's the, the path that God shifted us over to because God did not want us to go and watch a service. God wanted us to be engaged in the service. It's not about a performance. It's more about a heart moment. That's the reason Philippians 3 and verse 3, Paul begins his statement, we are the circumcision. Now, he's talking about both those who are circumcised and uncircumcised. He's talking, it, it does, it, we're not talking about physical circumcision here. He's talking about that heart circumcision. Romans four, uh, chapter 2 verse 29 says, But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not from men but from God. God wants this heart of mine circumcised. That means the filth cut away. In my heart, I'm cleaning up my heart before the Lord. That's the worship God's expecting from me. You want to know what true worship is? It's not a performance. It's me clipping away that part of my heart that is not good. And it's more about a spirit moment. Philippians 3, verse 3 goes on to say, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit. God is the Spirit. Now, I don't know exactly what that means. Some of you probably do. I don't know exactly what that means. But I'll tell you what, He's invisible and He's everywhere. And when I worship, you can't see me worship. Now, you may have thought you saw me worshiping a while ago. But what you saw was not what was going on. What was going on was invisible. When we really worship, what's really going on is invisible. There ain't nobody here that can see it. Mm -mm, it's real. It's real, folks. It's realer than that. And you can't see a bit of what was going on inside of me. But it was real. And it's more than just an experience of seeing something going on. It's not about a performance. <laughs> <clears throat> no, we think worship is we come here and you've seen, you saw this displayed perfectly. The songs were displayed purpose. Oh, and that was the worship. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not the worship. The worship is what's going on you can't see. That's where the worship's really taking place. And it's more uh, about a, a rejoicing moment. Because he goes on to, we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus. We, we rejoice with joy unspeakable because even though we've even lost members that are dead, we rejoice that that's not the end of life. Amen? That Christ Jesus came out of the grave, that we will live forevermore one day. And we rejoice in that, that we have hope of eternal life. And so we take the Lord's Supper, but in the middle of taking the Lord's Supper, what's really going on is a real rejoicing internally that we know that we have hope of eternal life, that Jesus Christ is coming again for us and will receive us to himself and we'll be with him forevermore. But it's more about also a humble moment. Philippians 3 verse 3 says, For we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit, rejoicing Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. I don't have any confidence in Rex Dutton that he will do the right thing the rest of his life. I have none. In fact, I have absolute confidence that he won't. I, I, I put him to the test. 
He's a mess. He's a mess. That old boy, I don't trust him as far as I can throw him. You say, I don't trust so-and-so. I don't trust me. Do you trust you? If you do, I think you're making a mistake. About the time I think I got it sorted out, have you ever noticed this? I got this. I got this. And then I'll mess up so bad. I'll embarrass myself. I'll go, oh, my goodness. What in the world is my wife staying with me for? And she's thinking the same thing. <laughs> and my kids will go, and he's a preacher? Yeah. Because it's a humble moment with no confidence in the flesh. I'm going to heaven, amen, but I'm not going because my flesh has done what it ought to do. I'm going to heaven in spite of what my flesh has done. Amen. I'm going to heaven one day because I put no confidence in the flesh. I put it all in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So Jesus said one of the true worshipers that what he's really looking for is that it would be much more than about some kind of performance. And then finally, number three, what he was looking for is the true worship is much more than a people. Now, by that, what I mean is it had been the Jewish people. It had been a special people. Well, it would be a special people, but it wouldn't be a people like before. It would be a people that would permeate all peoples. Listen to this statement. But the hour is coming, and now is when the true worshipers, he's talking about, he's not talking about the Jews anymore. He's talking about a whole other group. The true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. He's looking for a, a type of person that would worship him. For God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. It's more than about anyone who, who would just be a person. Well, I'm a member of the church. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. Or, or I call myself a Christian. Mm -mm. No, that's not it. No. It's more about anyone who would turn to God. Amen. Romans chapter 9 verse 25 says, And he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people. I wasn't a Jew, were you? And her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people. And that's what was said about my ancestors. You are not my people. There they shall be called sons of the living God. Why? Because we turn to God. We're not following the Lord. Turn to God. And it's more about anyone who would fear God. That's the reason Peter says in Acts chapter 10 verse 34, Then Peter said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears Him, and works righteousness is accepted by him. Whoever, 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 whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted. Amen? Amen. That includes you and me. It does who fear God. Amen. It includes you. You fear God today. It includes you then. And it's more about anyone who would seek God. I'm here not because I know God inside and out. I'm here because I seek him, amen? I'm wanting to know him more, amen? In Acts chapter 17, 23, it says, the one whom you worship without knowing him. I proclaim to you God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. He's not in some place somewhere. Verse 25, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything. We can't give him anything. Our contribution didn't help him. Since he gives to all life and breath and all things. Those are the things that matter, not money. And he has made from one blood every nation to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. All the nations of the earth are determined by God. Long ago, it's his decision where they live, who they are. Verse 27, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us found him today amen 
Uh, you didn't know it, but I was over there. I was finding him sitting over here in my seat. Were you finding him where you were at? I was seeking after him, and I was finding him. And in the middle of the prayer, I was seeking for him. I was looking for him, and I found him in the middle of the prayer. In the middle of the song, I was looking for God in the middle of that song. And I found him in the middle of the Lord's Supper. I was looking for the Lord. I was looking for him. I was searching for him all around. I found him in the middle of it. That's what we were here to do. And it is more about anyone who would believe God. Because Acts 24, 14, Paul says, I confess to you that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things. Just believing. I'm here believing, amen. I'm believing. Help my unbelief, Lord, amen. I'm here believing. Help my unbelief, but I'm here believing. So the one true worship is much more than a place or a performance or a people. It's far more than that. Yes, it involves those five acts, but it's far more than that because you can't even see it happening. It's happening within us. I've got to tell you this great story about this mother camel and her baby talking. It's a true story. Kind of. Baby camel talks to his mom and says, Mom, why do camels have humps? There ain't nothing else out here has got that. Why do we have humps? That's a good question, baby. The reason you have a hump is because we're desert animals. And out in the desert, there's no water. And that hump helps you to carry more fluid. So you carry a lot more fluid in your hump, and you can last a long time without taking a drink, and you can live a long time in the desert without a drink. And the baby camel goes, oh, okay, I see that. Well, Mama, why do we have these long, knobby legs with this round pad, round feet? What is that about? Oh, honey, that's for walking in the desert. You know, the sand gets deep. And so in the desert, you're able to walk through the desert. And because of those pads, you're able to walk in very, very hot sand without getting too hot. And so your legs are designed for walking in the desert. And the little camel goes, okay, I get that. Well, Mama, I have these long, long eyelashes. And they get all tangled up sometimes, and I just have such long eyelashes. What's all that about? So, well, the, honey, that's, that's for being in the desert. When the wind blows in the desert and there's sand and it's just blowing everywhere, these eyelashes keep the sand out of your eyes. It's a wonderful thing, and you're blessed so that you can walk through the desert and still see in the middle of a sandstorm. And the little camel says, Okay, I get that. Okay, so you're saying that the hump is so that I can go a long time without water in the desert, right? And you say that my legs are so that I can walk through the sands of the desert and I can walk better than anybody else. And, and you're saying that these eyelashes help me to see in the desert. Is that right? That's right, honey. Why do we live in a zoo? If God has so designed you and me to worship God, why is it so, so often it's so easy to lay in their bed? Why is it so easy to not be engaged in worship? To come here and sit like a rock and it mean nothing to you? How in the world could we be so designed to worship God in spirit and in the truth, and we can so easily go to a boat show on Sunday morning. We can go play golf, and it doesn't even twinge us a moment that we didn't worship God. How can we be designed for the very thing that's called true worship and be so little engaged in it that we can come to church and leave and not be affected at all? 
We were so busy writing notes, thinking of other things that we never even engaged. And that thing I was talking about, that invisible worship, didn't even happen to us. It just wafted over us and we found it all so very boring. How can that be? Unless, of course, we've been captured and put in a zoo and we don't know that we're in a zoo. And we've been captured by the evil one and we don't even know that we no longer perform as we were designed. Would you like to break free? Why don't you break free? Worship the Lord in spirit and in truth from, from here on. Never miss a service from here on. That this would be what your life would be about because it's what you were designed to do. God sought you from ages past so that you would worship him. If you need to rededicate your life today and come forward, we'll help you. If you need to obey the gospel today, come forward and we'll help you. But start today. Make this the day that you never fail to truly worship. Come if you need to while we stand and while we sing. Have you been